Go back. You can't stay here, so go back. I need to buy a microphone. Yeah. 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 Ye
The simple fact of the matter is, spiritually speaking, if you do not believe in the living Lord Jesus Christ, you are the possession of the devil and uh, the devil. And devil. Which is why Jesus says, in order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born what? Amen. Your first birth is not enough, because we're born into sin. We are born in the domain of darkness. So he delivered us from that domain and transferred you, when you came to faith, into the kingdom of God. No, I know. That's spiritually what happens. Now, it's the Holy Spirit's function in this world to live inside of you to keep you in the kingdom of God. Because Satan does not like what happens. Satan does not like that you have been taken out of his grip and control. So for the rest of your life in this place, what does Satan try to do? He tries to get you back. Through temptation, suffering, pain, maybe even prosperity, and struggles. Satan tries to bring you back into the domain of darkness. And it's the Spirit of God's job, duty, function, to keep you in the faith. And you know, there was one time in the history of the world where God's desire and Satan's desire were identical. You know what that is? When Jesus died. Satan filled Judas to betray Jesus so that he would die. And unbeknownst to Satan, he may be even tell you that he is a father. He did not know that that was part of the preordained plan of the Almighty God. That's right. And Jesus would die. So at that moment, their wills were late. I wish I was there to see Satan's face. <laughs> Jesus, I, I wish I was there. To just recognize, what in the world just happened here? This is unbelievable. Uh, nevertheless, in the same way, Satan will bring temptation, trial, struggle into your life. Maybe even prosperity into your life. But God will use those things. The Holy Ghost will use those things. Sculpt you in this world to firm you up so that you will be a light in a dark place. So it's not God's will that you be tempted, but God will use even your temptations to do what? To sculpt you for you. That's what we've been talking about, how the Holy Ghost lives inside of you to sculpt you, to form you, like a sculptor. And whose image is he forming you into? Jesus. The image of Jesus. A good sculptor takes an ugly lump of clay. That'd be you and me. Right. Uh, and takes his time and shades off and forms you into the likeness and image of Jesus. That's what the Holy Ghost is doing inside of you. So that you look, well not look out the way. You look in your actions. You think, you believe, and you act as Christ would th have you think, believe, and act. That is what the Holy Ghost is doing. And by the way, as, as a God, the Holy Ghost actually did the exact same thing with Jesus. You know that? <clears throat> Jesus gets baptized, and then immediately after he's baptized, does anybody know what happens immediately after he gets baptized? Well, I shouldn't say immediately. That day. In temptation. Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Is Jesus God? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. But is Jesus also a man? Yeah. So as a man, he has a soul, and what did Jesus need as a man? The Holy Ghost. He needed to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. So Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. I underline that intention. To be led by the Spirit of God in the wilderness is very important. He was led there. He went to a place of dry, with no food. He went to a place of temptation. He went to a place of struggle. And he was led there by who? The Holy Ghost led him into that place. And there he was tempted. He wasn't just tempted three times. What does it say? For 40 days, comma, being tempted by the devil. The whole time Jesus was in the wilderness, what was going on? He was being attacked. Now, that word wilderness, it's a place of scarce resources, no food, and it's a time of temptation. That, the word wilderness in the Bible has a lot of times that it comes up, but it's always an image of a hard place. 
Where does wilderness come up first in the Bible? Yeah, the people of Israel. This is what happened. The people of Israel are in slavery for 400 years. 20 generations of people. And then God sends them to deliver by Moses. And all the plagues come. The death of the first war occurs. They walk through the Red Sea on dry land. And then God makes them a promise. I'm going to take you to what land? I'm going to take you to the promise. A land of growing means milk and honey. It's going to be a beautiful, spacious land. It's going to be wonderful. So they get to the edge of the promised land. And they send spies out into the land. The spies come back. And all except two say, those people are too big. God let us out of here to die in the desert. We can't possibly take that land. And so God then says, fine, you disobey me for the next 40 years. You will walk where? In the wilderness. It will be hard. It will be a time of suffering and temptation. Ever since that point, the word wilderness has been synonymous with a hard place. But God made a promise that even when my people are in the wilderness, what? I will do it. Archaeologists doubt that the Israelites walked through the wilderness for 40 years. You want to know why they doubt it? Because they can't find physical evidence. Do you want to know why they can't find physical evidence? Because, well, <laughs> but because their shoes did not, for 40 years, did not ever wear out. The Bible makes it very clear that miraculously God was with them. They didn't have shoemaking material in the desert, so guess what God did? He didn't let the shoes go away. So there was nothing to leave behind. Everything remained static. So even in that place of hardship, God, what? Was with them. Was with us. Well, here's the synopsis, people. We are in a wilderness. The wilderness is what place? Here. This world is the wilderness. Don't ever forget this. We are now behind enemy lines. This is the way it functions. We are in the wilderness. We're going to be tempted here. We'll go through struggles, we will go through hardship, and we will go through pain in enemy territory. But God gives us a spirit to protect and sculpt us to overcome these temptations and walk through this wilderness. This right here is the wilderness. You know how many people I've talked to? Uh, just as evidence of this. That faith, that by moving physical locations, they will somehow escape the problems in their lives. Now, I'm going to tell you why this is utter and complete foolishness. Do you want to know who you bring with you everywhere you go? You bring you. All right? Every time you move locations, you subtract the amount of sin where you were and you add the amount of sin where you're going. Every single time you go. What happens to a lot of people is they try and find a location in the wilderness where the sins there are what? Attractive to them. So you're right. It's not this way. You're 100% right. But it is that way. We are still in a mentality that we can escape somewhere, anywhere, where there will be less what? Sin. Sorry, folks. <laughs> this is our wilderness. It's everywhere. Let's just go back to how this happened. I want you to see this in a cosmic way, because really, you and I are in the midst of a cosmic spiritual struggle, whether we see it or not. Our Western rationalized mind often doesn't see it. God, in the very beginning, created everything perfectly good. He made light, heaven, and earth. He separated the water above from the water below. He formed dry land out of that water, and he created vegetation. Then he created the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the cosmos. Then he made the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea. He made the beasts of the field. And then, as the apple is up, as the center of his creation, he created you. In Genesis 1.27, look what it says. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them, what? He delegated authority to humanity and said, I've made this beautiful, amazing, promised land. I want to walk with you in the cool of the day. You will have dominion over it. 
So he took the scepter of authority of this place, and who did he give it to? Adam. He said, you now can rule. Then they can tell him. And when they decided to leave the promised land, when they jumped off the reservation, and they sinned, they dropped the scepter, meaning the ruling of this place, and who picked it up? Satan. Which is why in the Bible, what is the New Testament called? Satan. The prince of this world. The prince of the power of the air. Not a king, but what? Did you notice Jesus and Jesus' temptation? Satan brings him up and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And what does what Satan say to Jesus? All of these have been what? Given to me. That's not a temptation unless it happens to be what? True. True. He stands up and says, all of this is mine. I will give it back to you if you sit without out of words. You are in control over what you create. Satan has created one thing. What did he make? He made sin. That's the only thing he created. So Satan is in control. So if sin is attached to something, who does it belong to? Satan. Satan. Hence, when every little baby is born, it's born into a world of what? And what does that child need? To be brought out of darkness into the kingdom of God. It's the spirit of God. Jesus was on a rescue mission. Which is why the Bible says these things about Satan. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Look at the language the Apostle Paul uses here. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. What does the Apostle Paul call Satan? The prince and the power of the air. Three times in John, Satan is given the title by Jesus, the prince of this world. Is there any? If you look into this place, <laughs> Satan is the one who manages it. There is no doubt. Why would Jesus refer to Satan, to Satan as the prince of the world? Because you rule what you create. Satan created sin. This place is now utterly sinful. Therefore, what? We are like the south and the civil world. We rebelled against and we wanted to separate. Jesus is the general setting his truth. Like a drop of clean soap in a bucket full of dirty water. That was Jesus entering this world. When it hits that, what happens? Does anybody know? That's who Jesus is. Jesus came in without a stain. And he showed the world that he had power over Satan. If you read the Gospels, you see this all the time. What did Jesus busy himself doing? Casting out demons, showing that he is what? A more powerful. We read it today in the Gospels. A legion of them with one word and they begged him do not throw us into hell right there Jesus is showing and that's why they were afraid of him who is this guy this guy is unbelievable just by what happened they're all gone he walked in water showing his authority over creation he, he healed diseases showing his authority over every effect of sin this is who Jesus is. <clears throat> but, Jesus was opposed everywhere he went. One of the things that people believe is that life of the Holy Spirit is one living without opposition. Sometimes American Christians, American Christians is a good get the idea that if I just live by the power of the Holy Spirit, that everything is going to work out what? The way that I want it to work out. I'm going to have a bunch of money. I'm going to have a bunch of stuff. I'm never going to get sick. I'm never going to have a hard time. Uh, temptations will be gone. They believe that life in the Holy Spirit is one living without, free from opposition. When actually the reality is something quite different. Life in the Holy Spirit is one with earthly opposition. As a matter of fact, if you feel zero to little opposition from this world in your life, I tell you, you might want to check to see if you're safe. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is, if this world approves of you, there is a humongous problem. If you 
find yourself sympathetic to the ideas and philosophies and the culture of this world, there's a human problem. Look at Jesus' ministry, just for a moment. After he gets tempted, Jesus returns with the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out for all the surrounding country. So he goes into a synagogue, he quotes Isaiah, and he says, hey, this is fulfilled in your hearing. But he tells them that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, are going to be saved. So he's life filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at it. He returned there in the power of who? The Spirit of God. So he's there, full of the Holy Spirit, tells them the truth of the Holy Ghost. This is how they respond. They rose up, drove him out of the town, and brought him to the block, brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him off the cliff. <laughs> Well, let's take the application. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, there will be no worthy opposition. Everything's going to be great. You're going to get the house you want, the car you want, the, the, the husband, the wife you want. Everything's going to be good for you because you've got the Holy Ghost. Woo! Yeah, Holy Is that what happened? No. No! Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost, told the truth, and what do they want to do? Kill him. Kill him. Throw him off the cliff. <laughs> then Jesus starts casting out demons. And the religious leaders of the day, those that should have been most in two, say Jesus is casting out humans by what? By the power of Satan. So attributing works of the Holy Ghost to who? Satan. To Satan. And Jesus says, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, and the kingdom of God is come upon us. Jesus claimed that the power he had to cast out demons was from the Spirit of God. I share this all simply to say, one of the ways in which the Spirit sculpts us to be more like Jesus is through the very struggles you and I make. Right. Through the very temptations you and I go through. Through all of our hardships and our wilderness experience, you know what the Holy Ghost is trying to accomplish? He's sculpting you. Right. He's trying to form you into Jesus. Absolutely. If you are under the impression that a life in God is somehow going to be easy in a sinful, hostile world, that is a wrong impression. But he'll be with you in the Spirit of Every step of the way. <clears throat> On that note, I want to showcase to you how important this is. So, if cosmically speaking, we're behind enemy lines, what does somebody who's behind enemy lines need from their agenda? Supply. Information. Okay. So if you're buying into the cosmic reality, which is we are on enemy territory, the enemy is aware of us, hates us, wants to destroy us, what we need most in it behind enemy lines is instruction, supply, to live our life behind this line to win as many people as we possibly can. Well, let's see about Jesus. I want you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, 1 through 13. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me. And I give it to whom I will. And you that will worship me will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord of God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, You will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So how did Jesus defeat Satan in his state of humiliation while on this earth? How did he do it? The word of God. 
That's your supply line. So how do you get in touch with the Word of God? Your spirit. You by the spirit. But here's the thing. Have you ever stopped and wonder? I don't honestly. Listen, I know I'm a preacher, so you can think that it's self-serving. Uh, but it's really not. It's true. Have you ever wondered why it's so stinking hard to make it to worship? And to make worship a priority? Have you ever wondered why it's so easy to sit down and watch a three-hour movie, but it's so hard to do a ten-minute devotion to work out? Have you ever stopped and wondered why that is? Have you ever stopped and wondered why it's so easy to watch it on TV to avoid, not intentionally, the very body and blood of Jesus Christ? Have you ever stopped and wondered why it's so hard? Because that's the only thing that keeps you in the kingdom of God. Your supply line is the word of God. How do you get the word of God? You get Christ himself in his body and blood. You get Christ himself as you hear the public proclamation of the word. You get Christ himself as you read the word of God. That's how you get encountered with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit doesn't just keep you. He uses the means of the word of God. When Jesus wanted to fight back the devil, he did not use swords and clubs. What did he use? He used the word of God. So the number one priority of the Christian, think about it just for a moment. If what I'm setting up is accurate, that we are behind the enemy lines, if you were in a real battle behind enemy lines, and there was a place that you could go to hear secret information from your general on how to survive behind enemy lines, what would you do? I would show up to that place. I would receive that body and that blood. Because I would recognize how dangerous the world is in which what? I live. Satan has lulled us in the false sense of security. He has used our prosperity against us. We think that we are sufficient what? Um, so we do not need God. Well, we know better. For our temptations, for our struggles, and our hardship, and our pain, who do we find out who we need? God and His Son Jesus. That's right. And where do we go to receive Him? Here in His world. Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome and gracious God. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for the cosmic implications of our faith. Because through Jesus Christ, you transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. And Spirit of God, you are sculpting us to be more like Jesus. And through every hardship and struggle, you are giving us God's word to combat our flesh, sin, and the devil. In your name. Amen. 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 We now continue with our tithes.